very much. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you today and to have a chance to talk about one of my favorite topics, the National Toy Hall of Fame here at the Strong Museum. And I am coming to you from our collection storage space, which is one of the amazing wonders that not everybody gets to see and that we are honored to take you into the depths and to share some of the items in the museum's collection. So let me start by giving you an introduction to the National Toy Hall of Fame. And if you didn't know that there was such a thing as a National Toy Hall of Fame, you can be easily forgiven because we haven't been around as long as the Baseball Hall of Fame, for instance, or even the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In fact, the National Toy Hall of Fame started in 1998 in Salem, Oregon, at a little museum called A.C. Gilbert's Discovery Village. And that institution, if A.C. Gilbert sounds familiar, maybe it's because you had an A.C. Gilbert chemistry set or a rector set, and those were things that were playful for you. Now, I won't say that it was collusion or anything improper, but the Erector set got into the Hall of Fame the very first year they inducted toys, back in 1998. Now, things were going along well in Salem, Oregon for a number of years, and they were inducting toys, and then they ran into a little trouble, and trouble's name was Raggedy Ann. Now, Raggedy Ann wasn't so much trouble herself, but it was a matter that all the Raggedy Ann fans were advocating for their favorite rag doll to get into the National Toy Hall of Fame. And they sent pleas, they sent petitions, they tied up the switchboard, they inundated the mailbox, and they were so overwhelming. They even had picketers dressed as Raggedy Ann out in front of the museum. And frankly, it became sort of the tail that was wagging their dog. They were a small museum, and it was hugely fortuitous when later that year, our president ran into their president at a museum conference, and our president said, you know, we've always envied you your Hall of Fame. It's something we always wanted to do, but you beat us to the punch. And their president said, you know, for the right amount of money, it could be yours, because they were ready to give it up. So in 2002, the National Toy Hall of Fame left Salem, Oregon, traveled to the other side of the continent, to Rochester, New York, and we've been inducting toys the first week of November ever since. And in fact, I'm talking to you on a great Toy Hall of Fame day because just at 10 a.m. this morning, we announced the 12 finalists for this year's induction into the National Toy Hall of Fame that will take place on November 5th. I'm not gonna get into those right now, but if you're curious, you can go to toyhalloffame.org, find out all about them, and you even get the opportunity to vote. This is Player's Choice Week, and you need get to vote for which one or more of those you would like to see get into the Hall of Fame this year. Now, with that little background, how exactly do toys get into the Hall of Fame? I keep trying to tell groups like yours that if you write your nomination for the Toy Hall of Fame on the back of a $50 bill and send it to me, I will take really good care of your nomination. Either I'm not as persuasive as I think I am or people are smarter than I give them credit for, but no one has ever sent me a $50 bill to my great dismay. So the real way that toys get into the Hall of Fame is you can go to the Toy Hall of Fame website all year long and nominate your favorite toy. This is better than democracy. You get to vote all the time, send in your nominations. And leading up to this year's induction, we had more than 3,000 nominations for almost 700 different toys. So we were swamped with great ideas for toys that should be in the Hall of Fame. That leaves it to some of us here at the Strong Museum to pick which toys out of those 700 deserve to be finalists. And just a dozen are the lucky ones. We look at three big qualities to see which toys get into the Hall of Fame and which deserve to be considered seriously. First, 
is longevity. These need to be toys that have been on the market at least 20 years, so kids and their parents could both have grown up playing with the same toy. Second, these are toys that everyone can recognize. Whether you had a teddy bear yourself, or a hula hoop, or a radio flyer wagon, chances are that you can recognize all of those. And third, these are toys that have what I call play value. We say they encourage learning, creativity, discovery, socialization. These are not the toys that you press a button, they do their little shtick, and five minutes later you're playing with the box that it came in. So those are the qualities that we look for, and every year two or three of those toys get selected for the Hall of Fame by our National Selection Advisory Committee. That's a group of historians, educators, people with expertise in the toy world, and they are kind of the academy in our own little academy awards. And they're the ones who make the picks that then get inducted the first Thursday of November. Now out in Salem, Oregon, they inducted toys in the spring, and we thought that that was kind of stupid, to be frank. And we decided that we would induct toys in the lead up to the holiday season, when most of us think most crucially about toys. Kind of out of the blue, we picked the first week of November, picked a Thursday, and we did a really smart thing, I have to say, because the first Thursday in November, coincidentally, follows the first Tuesday in November, election day. And that's when whatever happens to your favorite candidate, whether they win or lose, by the Thursday after election day, everyone is kind of up to here with political stories. The media is looking for a feel good story that people can get on board with. And I have to say in 2016, after a contentious election, CBS Evening News did a live shot here with me about the toys that had gotten into the Hall of Fame that year. Something that people could debate in a friendly way, but maybe not in quite the heated way that politics sometimes brings out in people. We'll see what happens with the election in 2020, but I know that the 5th of November here at the Strong Museum is going to be an exciting day as we bring new toys into the National Toy Hall of Fame. Last year, three got in. A really old plaything, the coloring book, a medium age, about 60 years old toy, Matchbox toy cars, and a relatively recent game, Magic the Gathering, the collectible card game from the 1990s. Those were last year's inductees, and we'll let the thrill, the anticipation build up until November 5th. But some of the toys that get into the Hall of Fame, and there's 71 in all, have great stories behind them. I can't tell you all of them for sure today. If I spent even a minute on each of them, we'd be here longer than you've probably counted on. And I am in collection storage, as I said, which runs about 60 degrees. And so I would be totally chilled by the time I told you all about all 71 toys. So I'm gonna sort of hopscotch through some of my favorites. I'm gonna clump them in categories that maybe make sense to me and to you. And Let's start with some of the oldest toys, because toys go back into prehistory, and those are included in some of the toys that are in the National Toy Hall of Fame. So for instance, jacks have been found in archeological sites all over the world, or equivalents that kids have played games with catching and tossing and picking them up again. Similarly, going back way, way, way into prehistory are marbles not necessarily glass marbles like we're familiar with, but clay marbles and stone marbles are things that are found, again, all over the world for thousands of years. Kites have been around for 3,000 3, years, I should say, starting in Southeast Asia. The rocking horse, at least 500 years. And coming up, still hundreds of years, but a little more recent, one of my favorites of the really vintage toys in the Hall of Fame, the Jack in the Box. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that kids are some of the greatest traditionalists in the world, especially rituals that they have. So if there's a kid who likes to have Goodnight Moon read to them every night before bed, they want it the same way, the same time, the same book, over and over again. And so for toddlers, Jack in the Box is sort of a perfect de developmental stage of toys. 
It's something that they've got a sense of control over as they turn that crank. So I don't know how many of you out there in Zoom land jumped when Jack popped out of this Jack in the Box, but even though we're grown-ups and we know what to anticipate, there's still a little thrill of anticipation. I liken Jack in Boxes to being my experience on roller coasters at amusement parks. If they've been doing their maintenance right, I have the thrill of danger without actually putting my life into jeopardy. And kids who love to play things like peekaboo and other sorts of games over and over again, the Jack in the Box is a perfect toy. It's essentially a music box with one extra action, that figure jumping out. And over the years, the figure has changed in so many ways. We've got Jack in the Boxes for every cartoon and comic strip character you can think of. Jack in the Boxes that come with Peyton Manning for your football fans out there. Or for the political side of things, we have a George W. Bush Jack in the Box that plays Hail to the Chief. So Jack in the Box is a classic toy for centuries and one that continues to be popular with kids and some grown-ups today. All right, onward to games. So playing cards are in the Hall of Fame. I think of them as the original handheld gaming device, but the Nintendo Game Boy is also in the Hall of Fame. Dominoes, chess, checkers, Twister are all in the Hall of Fame, but I only brought a couple with me today to talk about. So let's start with one that's probably familiar to lots of you, Candyland. This is probably the board game that most North American kids first learn how to play. And Candyland goes back uh, to just after World War II. And as we think about diseases in our own time, I wanna bring up that Candyland grew out of another disease, actually out of the scourge of polio that was a big deal at that time. And its inventor, a woman named Eleanor Abbott, was the polio victim. She made a complete recovery, I'm happy to say, but she had been an elementary school teacher. And one of the things she realized was that if as a grown-up she was so tired and unhappy and bored with her recuperation, what would it be like to be a kid and be getting over a serious disease? So she set out to make a game that was really simple. You didn't have to know how to read, to count. All you had to know was your colors. And that game was Candyland, introduced in 1948. Now, when I speak to groups in person, as opposed to via Zoom, they sometimes tell me stories. I'm not quite like their clergy person or their therapist, but they sometimes even tell me secrets. And a secret I'm going to tell to you is that grown-ups cheat at Candyland. Now, that's not because they want to win or even that they want their favorite child to win. It's that they want to make the damn game end because Candyland can seem endless. You have to go out on the proper color. And if you get a wrong color, you go backwards on the path toward go and it can take forever, seemingly, to wrap up that game. Well, the folks at Hasbro, who now make Candyland, heard the complaints from grown-ups everywhere, and I am pleased to tell you that if you buy a Candyland game today, the last space on the path is a rainbow color, so you can go out on any color card that you draw, and the game wraps up, the child goes to bed, the parent can go off and complete their evening, and everyone's happier in the end. Well, one more game, a little more sophisticated than Candyland. From uh, the time of the Great Depression, Monopoly, it was a game that was kind of had a twist and turn in how it came to be. In fact, it's based on an earlier game called the Landlord's Game, designed by a woman named Lizzie McGee. And she had the idea that she would create a game that proved 
how terrible it was to have a money-grubbing landlord who could gouge you for rent. She was really interested in issues of fairness and justice for people of all sorts of economic stripes. And she created the landlord's game that you could play cooperatively to work together, or it had a variant operation where you were out to get the opponents. And people called that monopoly. Well, there was such a craze for this game that people started making their own handmade versions. And it was one of the handmade versions of the landlord's game that a Philadelphian named Charles Darrow played in the Depression years. And he thought it was great. People made them to resemble their own hometown. This ones that we have in our collection come from places like Altoona, Pennsylvania. But Charles Darrow thought it would be great to create a game that was all about buying and selling real estate in a new boom town of that era, Atlantic City, New Jersey. So he took that idea, he made a board, he made the game, he started trying to shop it around. No toys company wanted to stock it at all or buy his idea. They said the game took too long, people wouldn't get it, what were they going to do? And he started manufacturing it himself, he sold a few, and eventually one of the VPs from Macy's played it, loved it, started selling it, and Parker Brothers finally saw the light and they bought the rights to the game Lizzie McGee never saw a cent more than a $500 payoff for the rights to her basic idea that was behind Monopoly. But Charles Darrow became a millionaire in Monopoly, especially in 1934 and 35. Even in the depths of the Depression, people had to have Monopoly all over the world. It was a global craze. Now, I didn't bring one of the most vintage versions. I brought one of the newer versions of Monopoly. This is Monopoly here and now that is bringing it a little more current. It's from a few years ago, but it has playing pieces like a Starbucks mug and a Toyota Prius and a Motorola cell phone so that it's much more current. It doesn't have railroads anymore. It doesn't even have airlines because we know how they come and go. Instead, it has airports because whatever happens, we're pretty sure that things like Hartsfield in Atlanta and O'Hare in Chicago will be around. And now you don't collect $200 when you pass go. In this version, you collect $200,000. So inflation has struck no more luxury tax. You pay the interest on your credit card debt, which is a little bit too much like reality for my taste, but it's one of the ways that Monopoly has kept itself current and has maintained its title as probably the very best-selling American board game and one of the best sellers all over the world. Now, a category I didn't bring with me today are what I call the wheeled wonders. And there's a number of those in the National Toy Hall of Fame. Things like bicycles, roller skates, skateboards, radio flyer wagons. They tend to be a little bulkier for me to bring and set on a table like I have behind me. So I didn't bring any of those. One I'd love to bring up is the Lionel electric train. And that was a product that was actually not going to be a toy at all. It was a store display, and there were products riding in the open cars of this little toy train or demonstration train in the window of a store, and people kept coming up and saying, oh, I want that train. I don't want the can of Campbell's soup or whatever was riding around in it. And that let Mr. Joshua Lionel Cohen realized that he had a hit on his hand and he started making Lionel trains and they have been going on for basically about a century now and still have their advocates today. So one of the inductees to the National Toy Hall of Fame. Also some toys that fit a category I call build it yourself or construction. One of the older ones of that is this toy, Lincoln Logs. And it's got kind of a elite history. It is the product of the son of famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright. 
His name was John Lloyd Wright, and he was in Tokyo observing his father build the Imperial Hotel there. That was uh, because of Japanese earthquake codes, it was built with sort of interlocking notched pieces that held together. And if it rattled, it wouldn't fall down. It would just basically rattle against the pieces. Now that made John Lloyd Wright think back to the frontier technique of notching logs and assembling them to build buildings. So when he went back home to Illinois, he started creating this toy that he called Lincoln Logs after another famous Illinois resident, Abraham Lincoln. And they have been a great construction toy ever since. Now Lincoln Logs went through kind of a downturn in the few years ago when they were made out of plastic, and now I'm happy to say they're back to being made out of wood, although on this set and more recent sets, the roofs are made out of plastic, because I had a Lincoln Logs set, and while the logs notched together nicely, the roof was made of slats that barely held on to the slanted roof and had a tendency to fall down if you actually just looked at it crosswise. But Lincoln Logs, Tinker Toys, Rector Sets, alphabet blocks, all in the National Toy Hall of Fame. As is this construction toy. This is my little creation out of Lego. And you really can't think of construction toys today without thinking about Lego. Now Lego, like Lincoln Logs, started out by being made of wood. It was sort of whittled and it had notches on top like we're familiar with with Lego bricks today. But what was missing until it got made out of plastic were the tubes on the bottom. And it's those tubes on the bottom that fit with the notches on the top of a piece of Lego and let it be so adaptable, let it hold together so securely that it is really tops in the world of construction toys. Today, there are so many knockoff versions of Lego alternatives. And Lego, when I grew up in the 1960s, was basically an open-ended kit. You've got a big box with all sorts of pieces that you could make into whatever your imagination dictated. Today, Lego has sort of gone to the form of kits, where if you want to make Hogwarts Castle from uh, Harry Potter, or if you want to make the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, there's a Lego kit for that. You build it, it takes hours and hours, a zillion parts, and by the end of that, you've invested so much in your creation, you don't tear it apart the way I did with my Lego creations and put them back in the box and start to play again the next day. You put it on a shelf, you put it in your closet, you put it under your bed, but it's been a great business model for all those licensed products, and Lego continues to be one of the top best-selling toys worldwide. All right, speaking of imagination, imagination is big for toys in the Hall of Fame. And one of the things we really like to cultivate in kids and to remind people about is that imagination is a powerful tool. Things like Crayola crayons in the Hall of Fame, uh, the Viewmaster, the Dollhouse, and we also have inducted some things that aren't officially toys. The first of those took place in 2005 when we inducted the cardboard box into the National Toy Hall of Fame. And every year for more than a decade, we went to the Toy Fair, the big trade show that happens each February in New York City and introduces new toys to the world for the following holiday season. And the year that we inducted the cardboard box, I was afraid that we would go to Toy Fair and all these people who spend their life and livelihood making toys and inventing new ones and marketing them would really come down on us like a ton of Lego bricks because they would be so dismayed that we were encouraging reuse of something like a cardboard box. You know, that wasn't the case at all. They came up to us at our booth at Toy Fair and they said, oh, I remember when we got a refrigerator and we turned that into a spaceship or a castle or a little house on the prairie, any number of items. And it was every bit as enthusiastic as everybody else was about the cardboard box. So two years later, I told you it was cold in here. It makes my nose run. We inducted the stick into the National Toy Hall of Fame. And 
we operate pretty much on the basis that any publicity is good publicity. And that was the year that comedian Stephen Colbert took me personally to task. And he said on his show that Mr. Bench at the National Toy Hall of Fame had personally ruined the toy business that holiday season because parents and grown-ups everywhere were going to go out to the backyard or the park and pick up a stick for their favorite boy or girl and not go to the toy store or the department store and buy any toys. Now, that wasn't really true, and I challenged him via our marketing and PR department to a stick duel. And I have to say that Stephen Colbert was not man enough to take me on in a stick duel on live TV. So uh, he sank a little in my estimation, but uh, we're still thrilled for that kind of attention. And uh, the stick is still a great inductee to the National Toy Hall of Fame. I contend it's one of the cross species toys in the Hall of Fame because not only human beings, but dogs know that this is a toy even though manufacturers may not produce it on an assembly line. All right, uh, other creativity toys, some of which started as toys and some which didn't. So uh, let's talk about this one. Let's talk about the Easy Bake Oven. Maybe you remember the Easy Bake Oven that cooked food with a light bulb inside. This is a little newer version. The year that we were, it came out the year that we were inducting the Easy Bake Oven into the National Toy Hall of Fame. And I have to say that I had never experienced an Easy Bake Oven growing up. I didn't have one, my younger sister didn't have one. So as we led up to that year's induction, I declared to my colleagues in the curatorial department that we were gonna spend a Friday afternoon baking with an Easy Bake Oven and eating everything that we made. Now, I learned a lot in that process. We fired up a couple Easy Bake Ovens, we mixed up our cake mix, and here's what we learned. One, it taught me patience, great patience, because an Easy Bake Oven takes about 15 minutes to warm up, it takes 15 minutes to bake your cake, and it takes about another 10 or 15 minutes for the cake to cool down enough that it comes out of the safety interlock piece that the Easy Bake Oven now comes with. So don't burn your hands. And at the end of basically 45 minutes, you wind up with a cake the size of a hockey puck. And I contend that I could have baked you a sheet of brownies the size of a full cookie sheet in that time or less. But what makes the Easy Bake Oven so great is not the quantity of what you get out of it. It's that it's the kid's own oven. It's not mom or dad's oven. It's your very own one. And you get to be the boss of how it's used. Now, I'm here to say that Easy Bake Yellow Cake Mix is just about as good as the real thing on the baking section at your supermarket. Easy Bake Sugar Cookies are really fine. If you're offered either one of those, you should not feel restrained about taking up that offer. However, if anyone ever tries to serve you Blue's Clues muffins out of their Easy Bake Oven, say, just say no, as Nancy Reagan would say. Blue's Clues muffins are the color of Tidy Bowl, which is a fine color, but not really the color I want any of my food. And the flavor, I have to say, is not to be described. And you can be reassured that I took the bullet for you and consumed them, and you don't have to if you don't want to. Now, uh, another creativity toy was one that didn't start as a toy at all. It was something entirely different. And before it became Play-Doh in these little containers, it was actually cut all wallpaper cleaner. And it was something that most of us don't have any familiarity with, but in an era when you had kerosene lamps, coal burning furnaces, you got soot and grime all over your interior of your house. And in the spring, one of the parts of your spring cleaning might be to buy a gallon can of cut-all wallpaper cleaner. It came out as this kind of goo, 
a little bit like an art gum eraser if you've taken any drawing classes and you rubbed it down your wallpaper it wasn't abrasive it lifted off the soot and grime and wound up in this terrible gray goo that you tossed out and you bought another gallon of cut all wallpaper cleaner now come the 1950s the people at the company that made this product realized that they were in trouble with baseboard heat with electric lights with gas furnaces there was no more soot and grime in people's homes and pretty soon they weren't going to be needed at all fortunately one of their family members was an elementary school teacher and she said you know the modeling clay that we use in my art classes is really terrible it's too hard it doesn't mold well what if you turned your product into modeling clay well that seemed like a great idea initially they sent it out in gallon cans to school districts they called it rainbow modeling clay not so catchy they rebranded it eventually as play-doh and they also did a really savvy thing they made it smaller for consumers to use and they tied their fame to the biggest daytime kids tv host of the day captain kangaroo who promoted play-doh and it was definitely a hit now at toy fair one year we had play-doh for the grown-ups who were there at the trade show to play with i thought i would see them making great creativity toys but i didn't what i saw was grown-ups kind of looking around furtively popping the lid on the Play-Doh can and taking a whiff. Because the smell of Play-Doh, if you haven't smelled it recently or you don't have kids of your own, it's really powerful in sending you back in your memory to when you were seven or eight, six or five. And I could see grown-ups really traveling back in time through the power of the aroma of Play-Doh. And in fact, that aroma is so compelling that when Play-Doh celebrated its 50th anniversary, they made a limited edition perfume that is scented like Play-Doh. And I'm guessing somewhere out there on eBay, if you're a big Play-Doh fan and you would like to spritz yourself with Play-Doh cologne, you can probably still find a bottle or two out there at a reasonable price. Okay, a few more toys some that weren't really going to be for the ages, some that were just looked like a flash in the pan, like this one. These are fad toys. And this one wasn't gonna be a toy at all, like, like Play-Doh. It was going to be a cushioning device for naval instruments during World War II. A man named Richard James was working on that idea. And he was, playing around with springs. They were terrible at cushioning naval devices on ships. And he was actually so disappointed, he set it to one side on his desk. But one day he did something foolish. He hit it and it walked down on his desk. And Richard said to his wife, Betty James, you know, I think we don't have something for naval instruments. We've got a toy on our hands. He challenged Betty to come up with a name for it. She went through the dictionary specializing in the S's and came up with the name Slinky. Well, who was gonna want Slinkies? This looks like an escapee from your inner spring mattress. And especially in the years right after World War II, a dollar for a spring, why would you ever do that? So one day, Richard James was doing a demonstration at Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia. And he arranged for his wife, Betty, to come and be the shill. So as he was demonstrating the slinky, she would be there at the back of the crowd saying, I want one, I want one, I'll spend a dollar and get the crowd excited. Well, she discovered something surprising when she got to the toy department. She couldn't make her way through the crowd who were watching Richard's demonstration. And what he had done was he had created slinky steps, little steps that slinkies were walking down it. And once they saw the slinky in action, people got why that was fun, that was unique, there's nothing else like it, and they were buying slinkies left and right. Well, I have to tell you in sort of a follow-up to that story, success went to Richard James' head. He uh, 
Sadly, ran off with another woman, left Betty and their eight children behind. He ran off to Central America, joined a cult, and was never seen or heard from again. That left Betty with the company. What's she going to do? It's the 1950s. Most women would have probably sold the company and moved on with their lives. She did a gutsy thing. She kept the company. She kept it going. She ran it well into her senior years. She always kept production in the U.S. And Slinky remains an iconic toy. Nothing else sounds or moves like a Slinky. And I'm not even going to get into singing the Slinky jingle that I grew up with because it's an earworm that will stick with you all day long and far beyond. All right, my favorite fad toy here is this one, the hula hoop. Now, there have been hoops of different sorts that people played with, hoops that got rolled down roads with a stick, but this was different. This was made out of extruded plastic, and you put it around your waist, and you actually had fun with it. It was a huge fad. The company couldn't keep up with demand for it, and I, don't have enough room right here to actually hula hoop for you, but it is one, my one talent. I am not deeply skilled in things athletic, but I can hula hoop for a long time. So I was at, whole, at Toy Fair hula hooping away, and up came a film crew from The Tonight Shows with Steve Sharippo, one of the stars of The Sopranos. And Steve said to me, Chris, can you teach me how to hula hoop? I said, Steve, it's a little bit like riding a bicycle. I can't teach you, but let's do it together. So Steve and I are hula hooping and the cameras are rolling. And this being modern times, Steve's got an earpiece in so that his producer can talk to him. And what Steve's producer is telling him is, Steve, your fly is coming down. So Steve stopped hula hooping, adjusted his wardrobe malfunction, as we call it in the business, and that's what made that clip funny enough to be part of the compilation reel that wound up on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and that was my introduction via film to late night TV, and I've been a media hog ever since, any opportunity that I can, and somewhere out there on YouTube, I'm confident, is footage of me hula hooping on The Tonight Show. So I haven't found it yet, I'm gonna keep on looking. Well, I'm practically out of time, but I couldn't wrap up without mentioning one more classic toy as I prop my hula hoop up here. I've gotta talk about her, Barbie, because you can't grow up in North America especially if you're female and not have some kind of love-hate relationship with Barbie. And Barbie has kind of a spotty past of her own. Barbie started as a cartoon in a German men's magazine, a men's newspaper. Her name was Bild Lily. The newspaper was called Bild. And Lily was kind of a gold digger. She was out to find a sugar daddy who would keep her in furs and champagne. She had a figure that was designed at the time that Hugh Hefner designed the icon of the Playboy Bunny, which explains a lot about why her dimensions look the way they do. And it was that character in the form of a doll that Ruth Handler, one of the founders of Mattel, saw when she and her family traveled to Germany in the 1950s. And she thought Lily was great. Lily was actually not aimed as a doll to little girls, she was aimed at men, and she was sold in tobacco stores as a gag gift that one guy would get for another. Here's a little lady for you. And if you've ever thought that Barbie was a bad role model, Lily came with a black negligee, a blindfold, and a trapeze. So she was far from pure as the driven snow. Well, Ruth Handler didn't come back with the negligee, but she came back with the idea for a grown-up doll, one that her daughter, coincidentally named Barbara, her son was also named Ken, uh, her daughter had always wanted a doll that wasn't a baby doll, wasn't a friend doll, wasn't a fashion doll, who was de too delicate to play with, and Barbie, when she made her debut in 1959, was an instant success. It filled a gap in the toy world, 
Ruth Handler was a very savvy marketer. She bought all the ads for Mattel on the Mickey Mouse Club show. Every ad on that program was for a Mattel product. And through that leverage of television, a great product, a great brand, Barbie went on to become the icon that she is right down to the present. Well, I've sort of occupied the full amount of initial time, but I am delighted to take questions. I'm delighted to take nominations for the Toy Hall of Fame. I'm delighted to talk about more toys if you want to stick around for more of that. But I would love to hear any questions, comments, and uh, any of that kind of thing. Thank you so much, Chris. That was awesome. That was very fun. And it brings back so many memories, of course. Um, we do have one question. Well, we've got more questions coming in. The first one is, does the museum accept old-fashioned toys, or where can they be donated? Jacks, marbles, Viewmaster, cowboy, Indian, and, and soldier figures. We do. We always love the opportunity to consider donations. And you can find uh, me at our email is probably the easiest way. My email is bench, B-E-N-S-C-H, at museumofplay.org. Or there's a feature on the museum's website, which is museumofplay.org, which is donate to our collections, and you can make your offer right there. Now, I've got to tell you, with 500,000 items, more than half a million items in the museum's collection, We've got a lot of things already, but there's always gaps, things that we don't have, great stories behind items. So we always love hearing from people and having the opportunity to consider those do donations. All right, and can you tell us the history of Etch-A-Sketch? All right, well, another one of my favorites. I brought it on my table, but I didn't have a chance to talk about it. Etch-A-Sketch is a product that was, um, based on a basic principle. It's basically based on static cling. It's gray dust is inside your Etch-a-Sketch, and when you shake it up, that makes that gray dust adhere to the back of the screen, and when you pull, turn your knobs, it's pulling a pointed stylus across it that creates a gap, and what you're seeing through the back line is actually the back black, the black, Back, easy for me to say, of your Etch-a-Sketch. Now, it was the product of a Frenchman who invented it and took the idea, he called it the magic screen, to the big trade show in Nuremberg, Germany. And he was shopping it around, and this little American company called Ohio Art went to look there, and they loved the idea. But it was too pricey for them, they couldn't make up their minds, and it wasn't until Toy Fair the following year that Ohio Art took the plunge and they paid more for the concept than they ever had before, $25,000 for the right to make what they rebranded as Etch-A-Sketch. It was the must-have toy of 1960. They couldn't <laughs> keep them coming off the assembly line fast enough. I'm told that the assembly line ran right up to midnight on Christmas Eve that year because they were so eager to get Etch-a-Sketches into the hands of kids everywhere who wanted them. And it's also, when you look at it today, a real throwback to television of its time with a channel dial and a volume dial on either side back before we had remote controls and didn't have to hoist ourselves out of our sparkle loungers or our sofas. Um, it's a vision of 1960s TVs and a toy that doesn't require any messy markers, no batteries, all of that. It's infinitely playful. I'm terrible at Etch-a-Sketch, but it's one that still is a fun challenge and it's made right down to the present. Thank you. And you know, Chris, I actually have my own personal question. What is the most famous toy of all time? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, probably our most braggable toy here at the Strong Museum, sorry, cold's getting to me, uh, the, is the first Monopoly game that Charles Darrow ever made. So it is 
hand painted. It's circular because the Darrow family had a round kitchen table that they played Monopoly at. It's um, made of oil cloth, the same kind of material that a kitchen tablecloth would be. And when we had the opportunity to acquire that a few years ago at auction at Sotheby's, we said, you know, we're going to kick ourselves forever if we don't try to buy this very first number one Monopoly game. And it is one of our proudest possessions here at the museum and one that is featured in our second floor gallery all about the history of play in America. All right, that's awesome. Any other questions? Um, I have a couple that say uh, thanks for the, um, the informative presentation and it was a great presentation. Um, the other thing I would like to just encourage people to do is afterwards, if you would like to you know, comment on your experience with these programs, you can email at Lorenzo Center, uh, Lorenzo Cultural Center at macomb.edu. And uh, we'd love to hear your feedback of whether or not you like the program. And once again, I'd like to thank Chris for an awesome presentation. Thank you so much and have a good day, everybody. Bye, everybody.